The blood of Jesus Christ will not profit anyone anything. It is not a glory hallelujah, sing praises to God, and yes, by His trust we're healed, and by His grace we're saved. You will not, nobody will be saved by grace. They are then atoned by the blood of animals that they may partake in the religious observances. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is Jacob Prash, just back from the Far East. I'm in the USA and California at the moment. While I was in Asia, something brewed up that's been going on since the springtime, since May specifically, that has disturbed a lot of people, and it certainly disturbed us at Moriel. I speak, of course, of the theological differences that we've had with Brother David Nathan. Now, let me say, first of all, I like David Nathan very much personally. His wife is a lovely person. He served Moriel and the Lord, more importantly, faithfully as administrator in South Africa for a short but important time. And I have no personal axe to grind concerning David, none at all. To me, and I hope to you, the issue is purely, purely doctrinal. I'm going to show you some film clips of what David has been saying and teaching. First of all, let me preface matters by pointing out that claims by some people that we did not follow scriptural procedures in going to David privately and trying to iron out these differences or explain to him where his doctrinal theology was wrong. We did not give him adequate opportunity to make adjustments, to correct it, to redress it that we didn't go about it pastorally enough. These things are all pure nonsense. They are not true. Any such claims have no foundation on the basis of fact. As David Nathan admitted, we met in Los Angeles, and the key issue initially was raised about his position that the blood of Jesus will not cleanse people of sin anymore during the millennial reign of Christ and that animal sacrifices will atone in some way for sin. Then he goes on to speculate, as he puts it, his own theory about various other issues. The primary issue was that churches and individuals in South Africa, in Great Britain, and in the USA were contacting us about certain things that David was saying and teaching. Now, we do not deny that he's taught many good and positive things. But let us remember, in 2 Peter chapter 2, we are told that even false teachers and false prophets teach many true things. Again, the Greek term, as we've explained multiple times, is parasogzusin, people who put truth next to error. I'm not suggesting that David Nathan is being intentionally deceptive or nefarious, but I am saying that there's a mixture of truth and serious, serious error in what he teaches. The notion that we did not go to him, however, or tried to get next to him as a brother, or behave pastorally, or tried to privately correct what he was teaching, is complete and utter nonsense. We went to him, met with him in Los Angeles in May. He admits that. He agreed at that time to correct what he was saying and give us a statement that we could put in our newsletter with the aim of laying the matter to rest about those who were approaching us. Now, understand, people were saying and asking, does Moriel teach this? Does Jacob Prash agree with what David Nathan is saying and teaching? People were beginning to tar Moriel and myself with the same brush in terms of belief along the lines of what David Nathan was teaching, that the blood of Christ will not cleanse people after a certain point and that sin can be forgiven by animal sacrifices. Well, that was in May. We waited patiently three 
months. Three months for David to keep his word. Nothing was forthcoming. We missed the newsletter deadline, and we still continued to wait. During that period, he was emailed and reminded, requested, Titus chapter 3, verse 10, you go to a person who's teaching error once or twice before you disassociate from them, was followed to the letter. Again, he himself admits we met in Los Angeles, and that was the issue that was raised. We waited three months for David to keep his word. These people who are suggesting that we did not behave in a scriptural manner, that we should have went to him as a brother privately and corrected what was wrong, they've either been misled or they're thinking with their emotions instead of their brains, imagining their emotions and feelings to be the Holy Spirit. It's simply not true. Truth, particularly God's truth, is always doctrinal, never relational. Always doctrinal, never relational. We see in the Syrophoenician woman or the woman at the well, Jesus was relating to these women, but he never compromised the truth. Philippians chapter 1, verse 9, that your love may abound in all knowledge and real discernment. Unless there is discernment and doctrinal knowledge of God's word, you don't have the love of Jesus. We went to David in love. I tried to talk to him to point out what he was saying was wrong, and he agreed to give us a statement so we could end this unpleasant affair. After three months and people continuing to come to us, asking, do you agree with this? Are you teaching the same thing he's teaching? Because he's associated with our ministry and because we gave him platforms in the USA and in Canada and in Australia and in Great Britain. We recommended his ministry. Therefore, we had a responsibility. The people who were coming to us had good reason to do so. After three months, we were forced to respond. If anyone tries to tell you this was not handled in a brotherly manner or a pastoral manner or that Titus chapter 3 verse 10 was not followed, this is a lie, a demonstrable lie. I'd also point out that Matthew 18 of going to your brother is about going to your brother about personal sin particularly against you. It is not about doctrine. When somebody publishes something and places it in the public domain as the author, they are responsible for what they have written. If it is doctrinal, they are accountable. It says in James directly, chapter 3, verse 1, let few of you be teachers. Teachers will be judged more strictly than the rest. If I or David Nathan, or anyone else, teaches something that is false. The Lord will hold us more accountable than he holds other people. We followed Titus 3.10. We were trying to avoid an Acts 2 situation where Paul accosted Peter in the presence of all publicly. We didn't want it to come to that. We wanted this thing to be settled privately. David issued a statement, it would have went away. But three months later, nothing happened. We emailed, nothing happened. We missed the publishing deadline for a newsletter, nothing happened, nothing. But then we discovered something that someone came to us with something called Foundation Principles that David published. He put in print. Now, I've written several books. I am responsible for what I wrote in those books. Not just responsible to the body of Christ, responsible to the Lord. If you write something and teach it, you own it. The culpability for anything wrong is on the teacher, according to James 3.1. Thus, I point out again, we did not behave in an unbrotherly or unpastoral manner. We did try to go to David personally and iron it out. 
We tried desperately for three months. Three months. David had been back in South Africa during that time. I don't know why he didn't. That's a question you'd have to ask David Nathan. But we didn't want any of this. We wanted none of it. We wanted to get it fixed up privately, smoothed over, and move on. But that didn't happen. Despite our best efforts, it just did not take place. Secondly, some people, perhaps in ignorance, have imagined it is simply a dispute about different interpretations of the millennial reign of Christ. I can't think of any Bible expositor I have a higher regard for than the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. He's one of my favorite Bible expositors, certainly the probably preeminent British Bible expositor since Charles Spurgeon. He went to be with the Lord some years ago, but he was alive in my lifetime, and his teaching is impeccable, but we would have disagreed on the millennium. He was not premillennial, I very firmly am. I wouldn't divide over that issue. I would discuss it, but I would not divide. No, it is not about the millennium. It's about something much more serious. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. We are told in the book of Revelation that even at the dire most of times, when an angelic means or an angelic agency of proclaiming the gospel from the heavens takes place, the angel is proclaiming an everlasting gospel. Now again, some people are trying to make truth relational. He's a nice person. He's a good brother. He teaches other things that are true. That all, that all is something we would certainly not dispute. But it's not the issue. The issue is another gospel. Can sin be forgiven other than by the blood of Jesus? It's the most fundamental of issues. Now understand this. In 2 Corinthians 11 and 1 Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, somebody is accursed if they have another gospel. That salvation can come by the blood of animals? We are told in Hebrews that the blood of these animals that were types, symbols of the Messiah, are a dunaman. They have no power to forgive sin. They're simply shadows pointing to the Messiah whose blood could. Well, David published a response. In the meantime, we received this published teaching he had called Foundation Principles. This is after three months now waiting for him to correct these issues about the blood of Christ not cleansing from all sin, about animal atonement being sufficient to do that, among various other things. Now let's look and let David Nathan speak for himself. I'm not asking you to take my word for anything. Please listen carefully to exactly what he's saying and exactly what he's teaching the people of God. Bearing in mind that our ministry and the ministers fraternal with which I am a member gave him platform and endorsement. We opened doors for him. We promoted his ministry. In three or four countries, we are responsible for what we did. People were coming to us. We had no choice but to respond after he failed to correct and retract what he said he would, waiting from May through August. Please listen to David. There will come a time where the grace of God comes to an end. For the Gentile mind, this is difficult to conceive. Because you, were, you have been grown, you've been brought up in a church culture that says that the blood of Jesus Christ is eternal to save mankind for eternity. It's not a biblical concept. It's a Gentile concept. It's not biblical. The blood of Christ will save until the end of the dispensation of grace. When the age of grace comes to an end, the blood of Jesus Christ will not profit anyone anything. The blood of Jesus Christ will not profit anyone 
anything. Well, this is very important and it needs to be kept on the, uh, the recording. There are some people who teach that these sacrifices are memorials that you look back to the cross. Nothing can be further from the truth. I respectfully disagree with that mindset or that form of understanding or theology. They don't look back to the cross. For the king is with them. There is no salvation. You see, many pastors and many ministers can't get their brain around the fact that this dispensation of grace is for a fixed period. There are so many ministers who go tilt. And so they can't, they don't know how to handle this. Well, you've heard David's words. And David says that the idea of the blood of Jesus being efficacious in an everlasting way is an invention of the Gentile church. It is because people are not Jewish that they cannot understand it. He goes on to say that nothing can be further from the truth than the belief or the interpretation of Ezekiel and so forth, these would be the passages, that the millennial sacrifices look back to the cross and they're a way, of course, to teach the gospel during the millennium. And he equates this with a Jewish understanding of the scriptures. Now, I'm not trying to get into a Jew-Gentile divide by any means. Most of you know in my own youth, I went both to a Catholic school and the Jewish community center. I speak Hebrew and I speak English. My family is a mixture of Jew and Gentile. My wife, of course, is fully Jewish. My children are born in Galilee. I understand the Gentile Christian culture and I understand the Jewish culture. I understand the rabbinic perspective. I understand the patristic perspective. I understand the reformed perspective. I've studied all of these things. I academically at university level studied both Judaism and Christianity. I understand both. The idea that it's a Gentile invention, that the blood of Jesus is everlasting because grace comes to an end. Now I have always taught, I've always taught that the time of the Gentiles comes to an end and that the era of grace comes to an end. That I have always taught, and with that I agree with David. The times of the Gentiles comes to an end, the age of the church per se comes to an end, and the era of grace comes to an end. It is clear in the book of Revelation that the Lord God reverts to an Old Testament motif, dealing judgmentally with the nations, turning his focus back on the salvation of Israel and so forth. We've always taught these things. But to equate that with the efficaciousness of the blood of Jesus, saying that his blood is not everlasting as an atonement for sin, this is pure heresy. The angel in Revelation preaches an everlasting gospel. That it's a Gentile concept? Alfred Edersheim the first messianic Jewish scholar in the modern sense of the word, author of the life and times of Jesus the Messiah, was not a Gentile. Franz Delitzsch, who translated the New Testament into Hebrew, was not a Gentile. David Barron, the first messianic Bible expositor, was not a Gentile. Joseph Rabinowitz, the founder, in many senses the precursor of the Messianic movement, was not a Gentile. Marsh Rosen, the Christian author and founder of Jews for Jesus, who wrote the book Christ and the Passover, he was a friend of mine, a premillennial Baptist. He's not a Gentile. My dear friend for many years, many decades, Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum, 
I'd shared platforms with him at conferences. He's not a Gentile. Dr. Michael Rydelnik, professor of Judaism at Moody Bible Institute, is not a Gentile. His predecessor, one of my own mentors, Dr. Louis Goldberg, was not a Gentile. None of these brethren were Gentiles, not a single one of them. Eric Lipson, who wrote the Messianic Haggadah, the Paschal Haggadah, is not a Gentile. I've known rabbis, orthodox rabbis, who became saved, regenerate believers in Jesus. I was a friend of the late Rabbi Michael Guberman. I was a friend of Rachmiel Friedland. These were orthodox, ultra-orthodox. None of them believed what Nathan does. Not a single one. Every one of them believed or believes that the millennial sacrifices are there to teach people born in the millennium who does not, did not have or will not have a concept of sin about cavalry. It is a looking back. How do we understand this? Well, the same as we understand the Lord's Supper. It's a memorial of something he did. When we break the matzah and drink the cup, we do it in memory of him. We also understand in Romans 12.1, present yourselves, Latin, in the service of the Lord as a living sacrifice. The concept of sacrifices, looking back, are quite scriptural, just as scriptural as looking forward. His equating the age of grace coming to an end with the gospel coming to an end and the blood of Jesus no longer being efficacious I'm sorry to use the term. It's not just erroneous. It's flatly heretical. Now, I'm not even speaking about conservative evangelical theologians who happen to be Jewish, such as Dr. Conrad Gempf, or such as Daryl Bach, Dr. Daryl Bach from Dallas Seminary, or E.E. E. Ellis. They don't believe what David Nathan believes either. But Alfred Edersheim, David Barron, Moish Rosen, Louis Goldberg, Michael Rydelnik, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, they all teach what Moriel teaches. None of them teach what David does. The notion that it's a Gentile concept is absolutely ludicrous and nothing short of ludicrous. Again, the Lord Jesus was not a Gentile. My blood of the new and everlasting covenant. But let's continue. We agree that we're told in Romans chapter 3, verse 1, to the Jews belong the oracles of God. But that doesn't mean everything every Jewish believer says is true. None of them say what David Nathan does. I can tell you for a fact, most Jewish believers who I know say what he's teaching is heretical. I don't know a single one who agrees with it. Some more forceful than others, but they all say it's wrong. Don't play the Jewish card that way. I'm a Jew, therefore I must be right. It's, it's not like that. It's not like that. It's never been like that. And don't play the card Truth is relational. They didn't come to me like a brother. Yes, we did. And waited three months, tried to deal with it privately. In his response, David Nathan raises a number of issues. He responds in the form, essentially, of questions concerning Ezekiel chapters 44 and 45, verses 15 to 17. Let me tell you what David Nathan is essentially doing. He's doing the following. Overlooking that Hebrews 10.4 says it's impossible for the blood of animals to forgive sins. It is impossible. It can't possibly happen. He went to a yeshiva 
a religious Jewish school in his youth, and he can read Hebrew, I assume. Therefore, I'm unable to explain what he's asking. He should know himself. He's confusing the definition of atonement, the excellent word invented by William Tyndale to explain something from the Hebrew scriptures and from the epistle to the Hebrews called kapora, from the Hebrew infinitive le kaper, to cover, to cover. The sin is covered to the Messiah's blood removes it. It makes kapora. He confuses kapora with korban, apparently, from the Hebrew le hakriv, to sacrifice. They do not mean the same thing. He seems to be mistranslating atonement back into the Hebrew to korban instead of kapora. Fundamental linguistic mistake, but not uh, isolated. He does the same thing with various Greek passages. He basically mistranslates it. Now let's understand this a bit further. We understand the seriousness of a different gospel. Again, from Galatians 1, 8, and from 2 Corinthians 11, 4. What are we saying here in David's response? Well, in his response, he doesn't seem to offer much of an apologia a defense of his beliefs. He doesn't seem able to aptly defend them. He responds with questions instead of defending what he's teaching. Now, on one hand, to go about as you just watched him, on front of congregations and on video and on YouTube, to forcefully assert things, to make strongly dogmatic statements and then say he's trying to ask questions, then why is this if what I'm saying is wrong? Someone with the gift of teaching would have already asked and answered those questions. I think here lies a part of the problem. When someone gets out of their gifting, two things happen, and I've said this before. One, they do not succeed. They fail at what they're not called to do. Secondly, they also begin to fail at what they are called to do. We have three kinds of preaching we can identify in the New Testament. These were highlighted by the famous theologian from Cambridge, C.H. Dodd, but we have three. Kerygma, charismatic preaching, preaching the gospel to the unsaved, evangelistic preaching. Second, didaskin, expounding doctrine. Third, hamelia, the pastoral application of doctrine. Now, a pastor must be able to teach. He must be able to deliver a doctrinally correct hamelia, an exhortation, a correction, a whatever. But he doesn't have to be a theologian. He does not have to specialize in didaskin. And although he should know how to present the gospel, he does not have to be an evangelist, even though he should be evangelistic. But he must be able to rightly divide the word of God and deliver a hamelia. David Nathan is not a Bible expositor. I can show you too many fundamental mistakes in his teaching. He says things assertively aggressively even, that when you read the scriptures in the original language are flatly wrong. I will show you other examples. Secondly, David claims to have some kind of ministry that he describes as apostolic, where he believes he can gather younger ministers and pastors to himself and be some kind of a mentor to them. How can someone 
who was in fundamental doctrinal error, even concerning the nature of the gospel itself, teaching that the blood of Christ is not everlasting, mentor anybody. David needs to lay the ministry down and go learn the scriptures better than he presently knows them. He needs to admit he was wrong on these things, and he needs to get mentored before he seeks to mentor others, to say the very least. More of that in just a moment, but let's go further. It appears to many people in South Africa, other pastors who know David from South Africa, that he left things like the Word of Faith movement. But he hasn't left all of their doctrine. He left the movement, not necessarily all of their beliefs in total. He speaks of the positive confession. And he highlights Matthew 14, 22 to 28 of Jesus walking on the water. Something not specifically stated in Scripture, but that Peter was to believe as if it were stated in Scripture as an example of something that would support what he calls, and some other people called, a rhema. The rhema being a personal word from the Lord, from the Scripture, not necessarily related to its exegetical objective meaning, but something that God quickens to you. David teaches if something is not stated in Scripture or doesn't speak to a situation, you pray to God for a rhema. And then you hold to the rhema as if it were the Word of God. Those are his exact words. And in support of this, he points to Jesus telling Peter to walk on the water. Now, first of all, Jesus is the Logos. He is the Word of God incarnate. The scripture, as we always say, is Jesus in print. Jesus is the scripture incarnate. The Logos told him to get out of the boat and walk on the water. Now, there are various reasons for this. Deuteronomy 18:18, 18, 18, the Messiah will be a prophet like Moses, and he delivered the Jewish nation from tribulation through the water miraculously. That was Moses, so Jesus has to come in the character and recapitulate or replay what Moses did. It also deals with the typology of the book of Jonah, of power over the storm through his death and so forth, and, and symbolic resurrection of Jonah. There are meanings typologically, but the objective fact is Jesus was there personally and physically. And Jesus, we are told in John 1, and Arche Kai Logos, in the beginning was the Word. He is the Logos. You cannot say that was a Rhema. That was Jesus, who is the Logos incarnate. We could never take a personal word from the Lord if we believe it's a personal word. And hold to that the way we hold to the Logos, to the printed word. We can't do that. Everything must be tested in light of the objective exegetical meaning rightly divided. You test a rhema by the logos, but you do not equate a rhema with a logos. Now, there are Greek scholars of the New Testament who dispute the definition of rhema that David Nathan and many people give it. I personally would not take issue with it, but some scholars do. Nonetheless, this idea that you can take a personal word from the Lord and equate it with Scripture and that kind of authority and stand on it and then take out of context completely a passage, a pericope of Jesus walking on the water when he is the Logos. He's telling Peter to do it as the Logos. This is a gross, in fact, egregious mishandling of the Word of God. No one in Moriel, including myself, is a cessationist. We all believe there's a gift of tongues. We all believe there's a 
gift of prophecy, we do not believe that these things ended with the apostles. No one in Moriel denies the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and no one in Moriel denies the ministry of the laying on of hands. None of us disagree with that. We all believe it. We disagree with those who teach against it. We disagree with people like John Magatha, who are cessationist. We don't believe in cessationism. We do believe in the laying on of hands, spirit baptism, and the charismatic gifts, including tongues and prophecy. The problem is what David Nathan says about it. Concerning the laying on of hands, for instance. In Romans chapter 1, verse 11, or in Paul's instruction to Timothy, chapter 4, verse 14, with the laying on of hands, it's nonspecific, it's generic, that I might impart to you some gift. David Nathan's teaching that most commonly this will be tongues or prophecy, that has no scriptural foundation. Paul says no such thing. The gifts are nonspecific. They're unique to the individual. They have no meaning beyond what Paul says. He does not specify its tongues and prophecy in either passage concerning the laying out of hands or in any passage dealing with spirit baptism. Here is David's next problem. No place does the New Testament use the word sign, semion. Well, we get semaphore in Greek, no place, <coughs> for spirit baptism. In the Great Commission, say in Mark 16, for instance, these signs follow the preaching of the gospel. But they're never called signs of spirit baptism. Signs of spirit baptism are not charismatic gifts. It is wind and fire, empowerment for the ministry, and empowerment to live a holy life. The gifts of the spirit will follow the preaching of the word. The gifts of the spirit will be manifested following spirit baptism, but they are never called signs, except in the vocabulary of David Nathan and of ultra-Pentecostals. No, they're not signs. Now, David did not resort to the old Pentecostal era of initial evidence, but he did say there were signs. The New Testament never says that there are signs as charismatic gifts to prove spirit baptism happened. This is an invention. Dunamas is the evidence of spirit baptism being empowered for the ministry that God has called you to and being empowered to live a moral life. Yes, we believe in charismatic gifts, including tongues and prophecy. Yes, we believe in the laying on of hands. Yes, we believe in spirit baptism as the New Testament teaches these things. But David's teaching is not found in the New Testament. I know where we got it probably. I imagine I know where we got it but he did not get it from the New Testament. Let's continue. Something else that David seems to make a lot of capital about is slain in the spirit. And he teaches, contrary to our own doctrinal position, that being slain in the spirit has nothing to do with the direction in which someone falls whether it is right or whether it is wrong. Now, to this end, he resorts to Paul being knocked off the horse in one of the three accounts in the book of Acts, chapter 26, verse 14. He says Paul simply fell, and he looks at other places where people simply fell. Revelation 1.17, he simply fell. In both texts, if he was to read not just Acts 26, but the Acts chapter 9 account, 
of what happened to Paul on the Damascus Road, he will find in both places the Greek term pros, pros, where you get the term prostrate, where we get the Greek word for worship, proskuto, where in human male anatomy we get the word prostate. It is anteriorly frontal to the dorsal cowper's gland. It's frontal. It's forward. Pros. It can only mean that in Greek. But he looks at one account in the book of Acts of St. Paul being knocked off the horse in the Damascus Road without looking at the Acts 9 account and without looking at what it actually says in the original language. Now again, if he attempted to do this at a theological forum or an academic symposium with people who knew Greek, he'd make himself the subject of ridicule. And I don't say that to be offensive. It's simply not what the scriptures teach. And John 18 was the only place they went backward, and that was when they came to arrest Jesus. Pros, it's always there. Always there. David Nathan is out of his league. Now again, how can he pontificate as other people who teach error do? How can he be so assertive, dogmatic, when he's wrong? And how can people who should know better continue to ascribe to him some kind of acceptance as a leader or as a preacher when he's wrong? They think with their emotions instead of their brains again, thinking it's the Holy Spirit, oh, he's a good brother, he also teaches true things. The things that are false that he teaches are fundamentally false. He does not rightly divide the word of God exegetically, and I can prove it. Now, I like him. I am to a large degree responsible for the international profile he's been able to achieve. And I apologize to the body of Christ on behalf of Moriel for the errors that I and others have made. And while I cannot speak for my brethren in CMFI, I know many of them feel the same way. Again, David needs to be careful. Peter says that false teachers creep in unaware. We're told in Daniel chapter 11 in the last days, those who uphold the truth are going to have many join with them in hypocrisy, as happened to the Maccabees. Now, I don't want to put Daniel against David Nathan. I don't want to include David Nathan in the ranks of those who Daniel warns about, or who Peter warns about, or who First John warns about. They were not really of us. I don't want to do that with David Nathan. I like him. His wife is a lovely person. I don't want to make those kinds of judgments about him or his motives. But I am commanded to judge his doctrine. And it is seriously false. It's not just about the millennium. Please do not insult the Lord or yourself by saying he's a good brother and we should be loving. No one was unloving. Being loving does not mean you accommodate serious error. It does not. To let believers be fed false doctrine in the name of love, that's not the love of Jesus. Again, I'd point you to Philippians chapter 1, verse 9. In this regard and in this respect. But let us go, please, just a little bit further. David Nathan, who many of us like, love, myself included, again sees himself as having some kind of apostolic ministry mentoring young pastors, despite the fact that he is demonstrably in very serious error on some very fundamental doctrines. The blood of animals, 
But he goes further. We are warned in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23, about foolish speculations. We are told not to do that. But as you will see, David does precisely that. Let's listen to him speak for himself for just a moment. And so what I'm going to be sharing with you is my opinion. Can anybody, everybody just repeat that? This is David's opinion. This is not solid doctrine. Thank you. All right, so I'm absolved. I have your testimony. This is what I perceive through the reading of Scripture. It is not a doctrine. Don't go out and teach it as a doctrine. Could it possibly be that those who remain faithful to the Lord will live upon the earth as Adam and Eve were first created to live upon the earth? They were immortal as long as they partook of what? The tree of life. As long as they had the tree of life, they were immortal. So the saints who are the bride of Christ, who are the kings of the earth, or the priests of God from all nations, do not need the leaves of the tree nor the fruit of the tree. Why? Because we have a body like Jesus. It is incorruptible. So why then do the nations need to eat the fruit? A theory... It's merely a theory. Perhaps they are those who were faithful to the Lord during the millennial reign of Christ. Now we have to make a distinction between what David Nathan says is a theory. He's not teaching it as doctrine. And what he does teach is doctrine. As doctrine, he teaches nothing can be further from the truth than the idea that the millennial sacrifices or memorials, and as doctrine he teaches the blood of animals will take away sin, and that the blood of Jesus is not everlasting. That's not theory. Those are the things he teaches. But then he engages in teaching a theory, speculations that we are told not to do. Again, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we're told not to do it. And then he agrees that in the message to the seven churches, Jesus says that believers will have the right to eat of the tree of life. And this, of course, draws on the, the imagery of Ezekiel 47 and so forth. We will have the right to eat of the tree of life, but then David Nathan says, in his theory, Christians will not eat of the tree of life. And this is speculation. The New Testament says, don't engage in that kind of speculation. It'll only lead to needless controversy. First of all, it is a ridiculous thing to say that Christians will not have access to the tree of life. What man lost in the garden, he will be given access to again. Jesus promised this in his message to the seven churches. But to come along with the theory and say, no, that's not right. After Jesus specifically told us that we would eat of the tree of life. This is wild. Why would you speculate and theorize about things the scripture says not to? And come out with a statement like that? This is a problem. No, if you are saved and you remain faithful to Jesus, you will have the right to eat of the tree of life, a God-given right, and the Lord will not take it away. But let's conclude. Again, truth is doctrinal. It is not relational. Don't tell me the good brother, the nice guy thing. Nobody is disputing he's a nice person. But again, a warning, and I'm not saying this about David specifically, but a general warning. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 11 that Satan's servants come as angels of light. Now, I'm not saying that David Nathan is doing this deliberately, but he's doing it. 
He's doing it. And it's wrong and it's false and it's dangerous. And no pastor should allow this into their congregation. John 10 tells us pastors are responsible for the protection of the sheep. Peter tells us in chapter 5, pastors will give account to him for the welfare of the sheep. You cannot expose people who teach things like this. If they come into a church and they teach something like this and people are enamored by them and they go on their website or read their books or their papers or whatever it is, they get the false doctrine and the pastor will be held responsible by the Lord for allowing it. I'm not saying protect your sheep from David Nathan, but I am saying protect your sheep from David Nathan's false teaching. The blood of Jesus is everlasting. Now again, in conclusion, David Nathan says he believes himself to have some kind of apostolic ministry, mentoring younger pastors over these churches. Let's look at what the scripture tells us. Apostolic apostle. Obviously, we no longer have apostles who saw the Lord, like the 12 apostles or Paul, etc. The kind of apostle who exists now from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 is the Apollos kind. Church planting ministries. Apo, sent out. Hebrew, shaliach. Somebody who was sent out by one church to plant another. Let us look very carefully at what the Word of God tells us about apostolic ministry. First of all, it's somebody who is sent out to plant a church. It is not somebody who was sent out to be an apostle to a church that already exists. When Paul mentored Titus and Timothy, or when Barnabas mentored John Mark, or Paul oversaw the churches that these younger preachers pastored and led. These were churches that Paul and Barnabas planted. These were young men who they groomed from the beginning on their mission teams. They didn't come into town or into another country and ascribe to themselves some apostolic function over local pastors. That is not what an apostle is. It's not what it means. And there is no biblical basis for doing that. On the contrary, churches that Paul did not plant, like in Israel, we don't see him trying to exercise apostolic authority. He left that to James and so forth. In Romans, another church he did not plant, he states specifically, most specifically, that he will not build on another man's foundation. If you say apostle, it means you're a church planting missionary. You're bringing the gospel into virgin turf. That is not what David Nathan is doing. Secondly, you do not build on another man's foundation. You do not come in and try to assert some kind of oversight over something that already exists. Thirdly, whenever you see genuine apostolic authority being exercised in the scripture, Matthew 10, Acts 13, the Spirit that set out Barnabas and Saul. Galatians 2, the right hand of fellowship. Peter and John give the right hand of fellowship to Paul and Barnabas. It's always plural. Always plural. It's not autocratic. It's not a one-man show. It's not monoepiscopacy. It's church planting missionaries going to virgin turf as a mission team of at least two leaders. We do not see that in what 
Brother David is doing. We don't see it at all. That's not what he's doing. He's not going to the virgin turf to preach the gospel and plant a new church. He's building on another's foundation, and it's not plural. Fourthly, we see an accountability. Paul and Barnabas went back and reported back to the church that sent them out to the elders in Antioch. When there was a doctrinal issue, there was a church council in Acts 15. There was accountability. There was no autocrat. There was no papacy. These ideas of uh, monoepiscopacy were invented by Ignatius of Antioch in the second century. This idea of an autocratic apostle who's not paired with somebody, it's not what we see in Scripture. It's not what we see at all. It's just not scriptural. I am a member of the Christian Ministers CMFI, Fellowship International. I want fellowship with other preachers who are doctrinally like-minded. And I want accountability. I have a board. Why does Moriel have a board? Accountability. When you see a lack of accountability, of oversight, you're looking at a problem. That can turn into something cultic. And it has done. Again, David is not following any biblical principles or model of apostolic ministry. None. Additionally, we are told something further. We are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, three signs of a false apostle. Now, I don't want to call David Nathan a false apostle, but if he doesn't stop what he's doing, he will be one. They have either another Christ, David does not have another Christ, another spirit, or another gospel. David does have another gospel. He denies that the blood of Jesus is everlasting. He denies it. He says the blood of animals can take away sin. It's not a memorial. Nothing can be further than the truth or from the truth that it's a Gentile invention. Now, this is serious. This is very serious. I don't intend David ill, but if he doesn't stop this, this heresy, will turn him into a villain. Until now, I'm warning about David's doctrine. I pray to God a time does not have to come that people are warning about David. Some already are. Not me, not Moriel, but some who know him from South Africa already are. I'm sorry to say. This is not apostolic ministry. This is a one-man show, there's no accountability, and he's building on another's foundation. He's not pioneering new churches, preaching the gospel in virgin turf. A few days ago, I was in Hong Kong with a dear brother, a graduate engineer from England who left Britain to be a missionary to uh, Northwest China to the Uyghur tribal people who are Chinese Muslims or Muslims in the northwest of China. This brother spent 11 years hiding in a storage closet that had a table, a small table, a chair, and whatever he slept on. He spent 11 years hiding from the communists in a closet. Didn't marry, couldn't raise a family in a closet. He spent 11 years in that closet painstakingly from 7 o'clock in the morning until 11 o'clock at night, translating the Word of God into the ancient Turkic language 
of the Uyghur people using both their Arabic alphabet and the Latin alphabet. 11 years from 7 in the morning to 11 at night hiding in a closet, a closet from the communists. Because that was a place there were almost no Christians and nobody preached the gospel. They didn't have the gospel in their language. I was just with this brother a few days ago in Hong Kong. He represents our ministry there. I know people who were like this. They planted churches. They went to places. This is real apostolic ministry. (laughs) What David is claiming to be apostolic is absolutely, absolutely not apostolic, except in one sense. Although there is no New Testament for foundation for what he's doing, none, it is a page right out of the New Apostolic Reformation Handbook. The late C. Peter Wagner's Apostles of the City or City Apostles. It's the de facto handbook of the New Apostolic Reformation. They teach what David Nathan is doing. Now, I'm not saying David Nathan is doing this deliberately, that he's cognizant that it's wrong, but this is what he's doing. It's not an apostolic ministry. My friends, the blood of animals are a dunamis. A dunamis. They have no power to save. Saved Christians will have access to the tree of life in heaven. They will have. The gospel preached is everlasting, according to the book of Revelation. These things are not Gentile inventions. I can give you an index of Messianic Jewish authors, expositors, theologians, academics, Hebrew scholars, who all say that the millennial sacrifices point back to the cross. All of them. I'd urge you to pray for David. I do believe he has the potential to be a pastor. But he has to correct these wrong doctrines and learn the word of God. And no other pastor should expose their sheep to somebody who does not believe the blood of Jesus is everlastingly efficacious. It is too false and too dangerous. I went to him personally. I met with him privately. There were only four of us there. It was very personal, very cordial, very brotherly. He agreed he would correct it and didn't. And then more of these things come out after three months. And people coming to us, do you believe this? Does Jacob Pratt believe this? Does Moriel teach this? After three months, I had no choice, no option. I had to respond. No, we do not teach it. No, I do not believe it. The blood of Christ cleanses from all sin. Jesus said his blood that is poured out for our sin is a new and everlasting covenant. Please keep David Nathan in prayer. I have no animosity, hatred, or hostility towards him whatsoever, and I've endeavored to follow scripture to the letter in dealing with this terrible dilemma, for which I am indirectly partially responsible, as are certain others, but I speak only for myself. God bless, and thank you for listening.